Hi everyone, this presentation covers the architect Moshi Safdie, specifically the intention of his designs. To start off this presentation, I think it's important to understand the foundations where Safdie came from in his thinking. So the first person was Sandy von Ginkel, who is a professor at McGill University, and he was Safdie's thesis, thesis advisor for a case of city building, which eventually became Habitat 67. He also was a member of Team 10, which challenged the modernist ideas of the time, and Softy was taken by his rhetoric rebelling against conventional modernism. Softy also interned for a year with Louis Kahn, and he fell in love with Kahn's idea of romanticizing local construction methods and the idea of letting the building be what it wants to be. Additionally, Softy was influenced by Douglas Shadbolt, who challenged Softy to not always pursue the Bauhaus ideas, but also just do what's right. So now that we have some background on what Moshi Safdie was taught while in school and shortly thereafter, I think it's very important to mention Habitat 67, one of his most seminal works. Uh, Habitat 67 is located in Montreal, Canada, and uh, as you can see from the picture on the screen, it's a very fragmented building. It's not, it's not conventional by any sense of the means. Um, so here are a couple diagrams that kind of describe what's going on. Uh, so this is really Softy's approach to urbanism and the tendency uh, for high-rise buildings and uh, mass public housing evident in cities like Detroit and New York City in the uh, early 60s. So the first diagram on the top is showing proportional uh, relationships in the individual units, and he used this approach to kind of simplify the construction process as well as kind of humanizing the scale of the building. The diagram directly below that kind of shows the circulation pattern throughout the building, showing the common points at which people uh, travel and traverse through, creating these public streets, in a sense, that are not streets for cars, but they're streets for pedestrians. Uh, and then his third tenant is uh, the unit-to-unit -unit relationship on the very far right, which is utilizing uh, the units very uh, well spatially and uh, putting a garden for every tenant, uh, which is something that Safdie thought was really important. Um, so these lead into Safdie's three principles, principles of design, uh, the three principles being humanizing megascale, reinventing and redesigning for the public realm, and searching for the uniqueness of place and program. So humanizing megascale is the first topic that I'm going to discuss uh, that was one of the principles of Softy's design. Uh, this topic uh, is Softy's approach to responding to, to modernity's problem with the dense urban city. As I just mentioned before, there was a large amount of public housing and that increased the density in which people were living in and the cities were just massively expanding and growing and there was no really solution to to that issue. So Safdi thought that by approaching these public housing projects, he could create a meaningful space for residents to live and interact with others, essentially creating a community. One of his tenets of this was a garden for everyone, where he thought that everybody should have as much nature as possible and get as much light into their unit um, as humanly possible. And ultimately, he felt that the public housing at the time was very dehumanizing. And so he very intently was designing for differences of scales and density in the sense of they were comprehensible. So the project of his that really exemplifies this is Sky Habitat in Singapore. I think this project does a very good job of explaining Softy's intent to humanize megascale. So as we can see by these series of diagrams, the diagram on the top left shows Softy splitting up a typical public housing unit into two separate units. From there, when we move right, he is splitting up that volume into comprehensible uh, volumes in which people can understand. The volumes on the left are too large that they are not within our human scale. So by splitting them up, it gives people an understanding of what a space like that would actually look like. So then if we go to the bottom left, 
this is showing the stepping in of spaces which is meant to create a garden for everyone as well as getting as much light and natural ventilation into the building and then to kind of bring this project all home softy creates these bridges in the sky that connect the two towers that now serve as large community spaces for residents to enjoy the next design challenge that softy is attempting to remedy is the reinvention and redesigning for the public realm. The public realm as defined by Softy is the intersection of the natural climate and the spaces which are used as cultural civic facilities. These have been dominant throughout history and across cultures and examples include bazaars, galleries, and arcades to name a few. We cannot lump malls into that as they are seen as a failure of the public realm as they're just a commercial shopping center and not a center of culture or civic facilities. So two tenets that Softy includes in this is he believes design should have many promenades and what he defines as an urban room, which is full of activity. And a project that exemplifies that is a Salt Lake City Library in Salt Lake City, Utah, as pictured on this slide. On this slide is a Part T diagram for the Salt Lake City Public Library. As we can tell, Softy likes to use simple geometries, rectangles, triangles, circles. And in order to create the complexity that he does, he actually takes these series of circles that are aligned along axes and then deletes certain geometries to enforce the idea and the circulation pattern that he wants to have in the spaces. On these next couple of diagrams, I'm going to show some slightly more focused ideas that Softy was working with. So here we can tell there's a curated view. He's pointing this towards the mountain using these the opening along the triangle as a sort of lens metaphorically highlighting the mountain as a focal point in the building. So on this diagram we can see the intended circulation pattern that Softy had for this building. He intended people to be kind of caught by this arc along the side and he uses that arc as a guiding feature to direct people into and out of the building. So keeping the circulation diagram in mind, we can tell that Softy, by putting this arc in and enclosing a portion of the space along the arc, he is directing pedestrian traffic through the building, which activates these public spaces as is shown by the lighter red color. In the darker red, in the more triangular shape, that is the core function of the building, which is a library where all the books and computers and everything is. And he orients all the public space around that, really giving the sense of integration uh, into the space. Softy's third and final design principle is searching for uniqueness of place and program. Softy believes architecture is material practice that one must craft with the materials available. Additionally, he believes architecture must respond and transform based off of the site's unique properties. One of the main tenets of Softy's whole practice is maintaining the social agenda of the site. In order to do this, Softy believes that the architect must immerse and understand the place, understand what's important to the people, understand the limitations of the construction industry, and I think his most important point is understand that architecture belongs to the user, not the architect. So one project that exemplifies this idea is Exploration Place in Wichita, Kansas. On this slide is a Part T diagram for Exploration Place. Upon looking at it, one can tell that this project bears similarities to other projects of Softies. He uses an axis and aligns circles of varying sizes along the axis to form his geometries. He then deletes geometries in order to make the whole building read as a cohesive unit. So Softy was looking to create a place unique to the site. And in order to do this, he actually diverted a channel as seen by the light blue in the middle of this diagram and made two buildings, one on the land side and one on the island side, playing off of the geometry and the ideas of the surrounding river. In order to create some unity between these complex shapes, Softy used a toroid shape, which essentially is a donut, 
to smooth out the tops of all of these complex pieces, as seen on this slide, in which we can start to identify the geometries that Softy used, but yet they do merge as one through the curvature of the toroid. If I had to use one word to describe Softy's design intent, that word would be interconnectedness, the overarching manifestation of humanizing megascale, reinventing and designing for the public realm, and searching for the uniqueness of place and program achieved through the manipulation of scale and proportion. A project of Softies that I believe incorporates the idea of interconnectedness is the Marina Bay Sands Resort in Singapore, shown in this picture, which is a very lively and multi-use space, which has hotels, event space, and a large observatory area on the very top of the building. Shown on this slide is the Parti diagram for Marina Bay Sands Resort. And as we can tell, there are a lot of similarities to the past Parti diagrams, uh, especially through the use of the axis and the circles that derive the overall shape of the building. Uh, and we can tell that there's a lot of axes in this and they all converge on one point that lies out in the river in which this building is positioned. What makes this building unique is Softy's use of the circular geometry in both plan and section. A section is shown here, and we can tell that the curve of the tower is derived from these circular shapes, as well as the smaller curves on the event space. And in this diagram, we can tell the spaces that Softy is using as the public realm. He's using a large atrium in the hotel area on the left and on the right as a very large promenade in the event space. And on the diagrams on the right, this is shown in plan and showing the, the directionality of these spaces. To further that point, we can see by the diagram on the right, the circulation pattern that Softy has intended for the building, which generally lies up with the atrium space. Now, this project is a very large project, and as you can see by the diagram on the left, this building is broken down into understandable geometries, i.e. the hotel rooms in the hotel building. Through this analysis, I can now categorize Softy's fundamental building function into two categories, high-rise residential and low-rise civic and public buildings. In his high-rise residential buildings, he employs the idea of a garden for everybody in which residents of the building have direct access to outdoor space. He also employs the idea of interconnectedness between multiple levels, not just the ground level, creating a new form of urbanism, getting people off of that ground level. He also breaks down the scale of the building into understandable volumes, which allows people not feel stifled by the sheer scale and size of the building, but yet feel comfortable in such a large space. Through all this, Softy creates a downtown and building complex in which the connectedness of the buildings creates a community. In his low rise and civic and public buildings, he employs the idea of specificity of site, which gains a love of the building. He also uses simple and understandable volumes so that users know what to expect when they are going into the building. He employs the use of strong axial relationships to organize the building and puts a large emphasis on the public realm as part of his social agenda. In closing, I would like to read a poem written by Moshi Safdi that I think very beautifully explains his design intent. He who seeks truth shall find beauty. He who seeks beauty shall find vanity. He who seeks order shall find gratification. He who seeks gratification shall be disappointed. He who considers himself the servant of his fellow beings shall find the joy of self-expression. He who seeks self-expression shall fall into the pit of arrogance. Arrogance is incompatible with nature. Through nature, the nature of the universe, and the nature of man, we shall seek truth. If we seek truth, we shall find beauty. Thank you.